listening to the 129th ever episode of the Missouri Sports Podcast, brought to you by 106 Apparel and recording from the Revel Advertising Studio in beautiful Springfield, Missouri. I'm one of your hosts, Cameron Albert, alongside my good friend and fellow Mizzou fan, Kyle DeVries. How are you doing today, Kyle? I'm great, Cameron. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm back, folks. Back in Springfield. I was out of town uh, for almost a week, so that's why we're a day late-ish getting this out to everyone. Um, I was in Billings, Montana for a work-related thing, and believe it or not, it was colder here in Springfield than it was in Billings, Montana. I was wondering about that whenever you were there. I was like, wow, it's probably so cold there. And I'm like, what? Nope, it's actually colder it was, here. Yeah, it was cold, but, you know, it was like uh, the highs were like in the 20s compared to like zero here in Springfield one day. You, yeah. actually, mi- you actually missed the cold weather because when it started getting cold here i looked up because my dad's from around that area of yeah. montana and they're like not wind chill temperature was like negative right almost 20 yeah and the wind chill was like even worse than that I yeah was like, all week we crap. were being told like wow you just barely missed the <laughs> you know disastrous cold weather here in montana yeah you're like thank you, goodness you get the and you missed it here too i know perfect <laughs> yeah uh it was like yeah negative 14 i think one morning here and uh same morning my pipes in my house froze mm. um and we're able to luckily thaw them out that afternoon with enough sunshine but i was a little worried that we would be w- uh, without water for several days because it was going to be below way below 32 did they, did they shut off the power at some point i never lost power okay uh, luckily i knew they were like shutting people's power off on purpose yeah i think to, they like, were doing some energy some rolling blackouts but we never had that happen pretty crazy uh, well, Kyle, since the last time we spoke, uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. We've got a couple of things to go over. Uh, first of all, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. That uh, number of YouTube subscribers is growing every day. We appreciate everybody over there. We appreciate the engagement there. And don't forget, you can support us over at Patreon. That would be patreon.com slash Missouri Sports Pod. If you got a, a couple bucks in your pocket that, you know, if you dropped it and you wouldn't notice that you dropped it, maybe just consider giving it to us on Patreon. So patreon.com slash Missouri Sports Pod. Now we got some news. Kyle, Mizzou football is now going to be without the services of defensive backs coach David Gibbs. Yeah, um, anytime you lose a position position coach, you know, it, it's a bummer. Um, that's relationships and recruiting and with current players that you – have to start over with a new uh, with somebody else, and uh, yeah, I, th- I definitely think David Gibbs was probably in the running for Missouri's defensive coordinator position when they were hiring uh, a month or two back, and obviously did not get that position. And I think that probably has a uh, pl- plays a pretty big role in why he decided to move on, as he gets to be a defensive coordinator at UCF mm-hmm. now. Yeah, co-defensive coordinator at UCF under their new head coach Gus Malzahn. So they were. Uh, UCF has really been in the coaching carousel lately um, and with they've had great success um, going all the way back to Scott Frost who uh, left to go to Nebraska then they got Josh Heupel who just recently left for Tennessee and now they get uh, Gus Malzahn who was fired from Auburn so it's literally just like NCAA football video game yeah at the end of the season in dynasty mode when you see all the coaches trading places yeah Uh, Gus Malzahn definitely seems like a clear upgrade to Josh Heupel, at least in my mind. But UCF is kind of in that unfortunate position where they're a really good program, at least in the last 10 years or so. But it's still kind of a stepping stone for a lot of those successful coaches to go get a SEC job or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, But, yeah, Gus Malzahn, I mean, that, that should be interesting to see how, how he does there. Another name that will no longer be associated with Mizzou football is Jack Buford. Yeah, n- another one that's uh, a bummer to see. Uh, in-state guy, I think he was from Lutheran North in St. Louis, but offensive lineman who uh, was beloved in his recruiting process. He was so uh, outspoken on Twitter, and I, I think he's he's responsible for helping a lot of guys get to Mizzou in that recruiting class. And um, So just didn't see the field for whatever reason, but hopefully he's able to go find some playing time somewhere. Yeah, I was looking back at his um, the state of Missouri for 2019 recruiting. Uh, he was seventh in the state according to 24/7 Sports, um, and a pretty good haul from the state for Mizzou that year. They also got Jelani Williams, C.J. Boone, Maurice Massey, 
Martez Manuel, Nico Hay, but now he'll be the the third of that group to have moved on, um, along with C.J. Boone and Maurice Massey. It's always a shame, though, when you look at the top of that list and you see Ohio State, Illinois, Texas. Yeah, that, I mean, th- those recruiting battles that you feel like are imperative to win and are – and then that guy never sees the field. Like it's yeah. it's kind of weird. Yeah. But that's just how it goes sometimes. Indeed. It's tough to it's tough to know how a guy's going to transition from high school to college. It's just a completely different ball game. Yeah. He was a four star. A- according to the composite, he was seventh. If you just look at twenty four seven sports rating, he uh, was number three in the state. Um. All right. So whether you like it or not, we have to talk about basketball and uh i like talking about basketball yeah so do i usually (laughs) um kyle i want to take you back in time to uh just about a week ago when the ncaa tournament selection committee released the top 16 teams in their mind and seeded them into a potential ncaa tournament bracket and our Missouri Tigers were a four seed in that bracket. The last team to make the list, number 16. But they were a four seed nonetheless, maybe uh, just a, a tad higher than you or I had them uh, going into that week. And uh, I fully expected them to be not on that list. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that they were a four seed in the eyes of the uh, selection committee. Yeah, I was thrilled to see them on there because th- this is the same committee that is going to be making – the calls uh you know a month from now or whenever that is and they're making the the they are making the actual bracket in march and i was so happy to see that they were able to kind of look beyond the analytics and and see uh what what have you done this year what have you accomplished this season uh and obviously they rewarded missouri big time with the wins that they have and not only did it really appear like they liked missouri but they like a lot of the teams that missouri has victories over and uh, Alabama was a two seed, Tennessee was a three seed, Illinois was a two seed. So they not only do they like Missouri, but they think highly of the teams that Missouri has beaten. So that definitely bodes well for us as well. Uh, I was just pulling it up here. And when I typed in bracket preview, the first article that comes up is from the Sporting News. And it's called NCAA Tournament Bracket Preview May Have Positioned in Missouri for Hard Selection Sunday Fall. When was that written? That was written four hours ago. <laughs> so, the, well, <laughs> honestly, if, if, I would if people that aren't quite in the know, maybe they're not uh, watching every Mizzou game and they saw, oh, four seed. And then like Selection Sunday comes and it's not quite uh, at that same level, then, yeah, people may be surprised. But if you're watching them play the last few games, then uh, I don't think anybody's expecting them to remain a four seed. Yeah, well, Missouri has an innate ability to do something terrible right after something good happens. Like oh, yeah. So, something good like uh, good news in the rankings or they uh, – Beating Alabama. Or they beat, or they beat someone. Beat uh, a they top ten team. <laughs> beat anyone. Yeah. They decide to uh, follow that up immediately with a terrible performance. And uh, that just seems to be yet another example of that where – it's like, oh, wow, uh, the committee loves us. Uh, I guess we can relax. And uh, nope, they have done they've – pl- they've lost two games they shouldn't since then. So uh, I don't know what it is, but it's uh, just that ability to uh, – they, they relax when they shouldn't, and they have to have their backs against the wall to, to win a game apparently. Yeah, you uh, would like it for it not to be that way, but uh – I think they will find their backs against the wall again uh, right now. Yeah, so I think their backs were against the wall against Georgia, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get there. Um, first, uh, Missouri lost to Arkansas in overtime 86-81. And um, this was a tough one. Uh, Missouri, we found out right before the game, was going to be without Jeremiah Tillman. And uh, that, I think, loomed large uh, for the whole game. Uh, Justin Smith played incredibly well for Arkansas obviously he was not uh, uh, healthy for their first um, meeting with Missouri I always want to assume that the first time they played was in Columbia because Missouri just trounced them and then uh, 
but actually that was in Fayetteville, and this time um, Arkansas got the win in Columbia. And I kind of felt like maybe it was a little bit inevitable before the game that this Arkansas team is, is really good, honestly. And getting Justin Smith back, it just – they don't seem like the type of team that Missouri is going to beat twice in the same season. So to see Missouri struggle, especially without Tillman, it just kind of all made sense to some extent. But they were still right there and probably should have won this game. Uh, just a few plays down the stretch that didn't go their way, and they just couldn't quite make it happen. Yeah, I was actually really pleased with uh, their effort in this game, and um, especially not having Tillman. But uh, we got some really good performances from Torrance Watson. He, he stepped up, and uh, we – made like 13 three-pointers in this game which is has to be one of the highest performances we, we've had as far as three-pointers go shot like what 40 41 percent from three mm-hmm. yeah 13 out of 32 yeah so we we needed everything we got from watson we needed all of those three-pointers to even have a shot in this game so uh considering we had to kind of play differently than we have been uh i was really pleased with with their effort yeah, offensively, I think I can agree with you. Um, and you mentioned Torrance Watson. He had an uptick in minutes in this one, um, ended up with 26 minutes. Um, and he was three for five from three. Those were all nine of his points. And he looked pretty good on defense as well. Ended up with three steals. Although I think one of those, he he stole the ball and then like immediately turned it over, um, trying to go the other way with it. <laughs> but uh, still, he got the steal uh, before that. Um what what do you think about Torrance Watson? He's been underutilized, and uh, many have pointed to his lack of success on the defensive end. I think in recent games, maybe he's shored that up a little bit. And if he can be providing some made baskets on offense, then I think we got to get him involved. I agree. At this point, Mark Smith does a, does a lot of good things. He he defends well. He plays with with good intensity. Um, but he's just not providing really truly what we need from him. We have other we have uh, other guys that can provide some of those good hustle minutes, and I think Torrance Watson could probably do that too, but we really need somebody that can that can put the ball in the basket, um, can make three-pointers, can stretch the floor, and right now Mark Smith is just not a threat to do those things, and I, I really like Mark, and I obviously wish that I, – I hope – for the for the best and i want him to figure those those struggles out because it 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 sucks to see him clearly struggling and kind of dealing with this mentally but uh i I absolutely think torrence watson has earned the right to get out there a little bit more and i'm just not sure we would miss mark smith as much as maybe conzo thinks we might but yeah watching the last two games i was uh, i was really noticing the difference between mark smith's aggressive effort plays diving after loose balls um playing solid defense and just his inability to do anything on offense and it got me thinking like man mark smith is such an enjoyable player to watch and um when he's making shots he's like you know one of your he could be easily one of your favorite mizzou players of all time like for me if he's making shots at even just like a 35% 35% clip from three or better, then he's just bringing everything I need yep. from a player. And he, he's so fun to watch outside of um, when he shoots it that if he's just making shots, then he's so fun. But in conference play this year, he is shooting 24% from three. And that's just terrible. That's not going to get it done considering he's who we rely on and yeah. he shoots a lot. Yeah. That's that's not good enough. Yeah. 0 for 5 uh, from 3 against Arkansas. Um, Watson was 3 for 5. Uh, Pinson was 5 for 8 and he was kind of keeping Missouri in this one. Uh, they couldn't get a whole lot going uh, in the paint without Tillman. The shot just 48% uh, from 2 but then 41% from three in Arkansas really destroyed uh, Missouri when it comes to free throw shooting 20 for 23 for Arkansas just 14 for 21 for Missouri so they obviously left some points at the free throw line yeah Missouri's really been struggling from the line recently I don't know I have no idea but what was what we were probably best at last year is now what we're worst at somehow but uh 
Yeah. And one more note on Torrance. Still worse at three-point shooting. Probably. Well, one more thing on Torrance Watson. I, assuming Mark Smith and a lot of the seniors move on next year, um, I, I really think, assuming he's still on Mizzou's squad next year, I, I really think we're going to be forced to play Torrance Watson a yeah. lot. I think he's going to play a lot next year. And so I would love to just see him get more experience in conference play this year. Um, and I, I really don't know why you wouldn't. But anyways, um, yeah, Ar- Arkansas – had a really dominant second half like we've it's a trend we've really been seeing recently but they i think they realized oh yeah jeremiah tillman's not playing we can do whatever we want inside and and they really did that and justin turner was an absolute force or justin turner (laughs) justin smith (laughs) justin turner's pretty good justin turner's pretty good and he also plays third base for the dodgers anyways (laughs) justin smith was dominant in the second half for arkansas in this game and they're making all their free throws like you said yeah it it was really it was really a frustrating uh, second half to watch uh, Justin Turner is also playing really well for Bowling Green this year, uh, shooting 32% from three. That's a, a tick down from his 36% last season, uh, but he, he's doing pretty well. He, he'd probably fit in pretty well, I don't know, on a team like uh, Missouri. Missouri? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Man, we should have recruited him. Yeah, he's uh, fourth in the conference uh, as far as the all Ken Palm team for the Mid-American Conference. So one of the better players in that conference over there. I'll never understand. Well, whatever. There's <laughs> mo- there's more to life than playing time, I guess. But yeah, whatever. And playing in the SEC and going to the NCAA tournament. There's more than all that, I suppose. But um, playing for Conzo Martin. <laughs> Where were we? Arkansas. They just looked good. Second half. Uh, Justin Smith showed that he's you know incredibly talented. And they really missed him the first time. I mean, you could you could easily see how he impacted them offensively. Um, he had 19 points and uh, was doing everything. He made a three, obviously throwing down massive alley oops. Got to the free throw line, uh, was rebounding, had three assists, two steals. So he was kind of all over the place doing everything. Had a three pointer too. Yep. Uh, Moses Moody. Uh, played well, two for four uh, from three. He was in foul trouble a little bit, so he was limited. Um, but you know, Missouri giving up 1.13 points per possession. That's just not going to cut it. Yeah. When Tillman's out, we're, we're pretty thin on the interior. I mean, Kobe Brown, Parker, uh, Parker Brown and, uh, Mitchell Smith, they can all bring something to the table, but none of them are as well-rounded as Tillman is obviously. And when Kobe Brown went down in this game with some cramping and stuff, I don't think he played a lot in the second half. Whenever you got Mitchell Smith and Parker Brown out there, the whole game or this whole second half, that was really just the key, I think, for it was just enough uh, for Arkansas to, to really take advantage. Yeah, I think Mitchell Smith is solid defensively for the most part, but he just doesn't bring that like back to the basket big type scoring that Tillman brings, even a little bit. I mean, like when he catches it in the post, it's like throw it back out. Yeah, <laughs> or like fade away or something. He just doesn't really know. Um, how to take advantage of the way Tillman does. Mm -hmm. Um, You mentioned uh, Kobe Brown not playing a lot of minutes in the second half. Um, I got to mention Javon Pickett. Uh, He, there was kind of a head scratching situation with him late in the game. He only logged eight minutes total in this game. And late in the second half, Conzo did an offense defense substitution with Penson. So Pickett came in to play defense and after I immediately thought, wow, Pickett has not been, seen the floor for a long time. And looking now and seeing that he only played eight minutes, that was probably even longer than I realized. And he came in, Arkansas had the ball. They drew up a play for the person he was guarding and got an easy bucket. And it was a, a game changing play where if Missouri ha- was able to get a stop there, then um, they'd be kind of in the driver's seat. But I, I want to say maybe it was either tied or one point game and it gave Arkansas the lead or extended it to three, something like that. Yeah, he may not have played very much because Watson was in there so much too. But, yeah, it seemed a little bit interesting to throw him in there in such a pivotal Maybe play. Maybe a little bit of size. but Yeah, when he, when he probably was a little bit cold. Yeah. And then right after that, I think, the very next possession from Missouri, uh, I think they were down three. Penson just kind of dribbled to the wing and launched a three-pointer that – was ill-advised i think it was if not an air ball it was almost an air ball that was and awful. then missouri had to start fouling it was pretty much over at that point 
the end of regulation was really exciting though um yeah. uh, parker brown let's see he had like a nice i can't remember which happened first i think he didn't he have a, a bucket and then he got the block on the other end is that what happened i can't remember it may have been the other way around but i don't remember yeah he, he got a bucket whatever and a block. whatever happened he made two plays in a row yeah. to to kind of get missouri into overtime there and that was really exciting and i kind of felt like they had the momentum going to overtime yeah i mean they kind of had to mount a little bit of comeback just to get it to overtime Mm -hmm. so yeah i think easily arkansas could have won this in regulation and it was impressive that missouri was able to even force overtime but then uh once they did and they even had a lead in overtime but just couldn't quite couldn't quite hold on to it um looking at the Stats from Missouri real quick. Uh, Pinson had 23 points. Uh, Drew Smith with 15. And, I don't know, just without Tillman, he's that third piece of the puzzle most of the time that you kind of need something from him to get it going. And anybody that you're going to try to replace his production with is just not going to be able to do it. So I think we probably both agree that if Tillman plays, Missouri probably wins this game. Yeah, I think so. When you're looking at such a such a close margin – I think that makes a difference, especially defensively in the second half, I got to believe. Yep, I agree. Um, so, unfortunately, um, Missouri wasn't able to rebound from this one uh, like they have some other times in the season. Uh, they went to Georgia and got beat 80-70. to 70, And this one was a tough one to watch down the stretch. Um Missouri jumped out to an okay lead and they stretched it out a little bit going in, you know, at the beginning of the second half and looked like they were going to be able to do exactly what they needed to do without Tillman, just, just make it happen and just be a better team than Georgia. But then it just, it just fell apart. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you can take us through that second half a little bit more, um, what you were seeing, but I don't know. Uh, Georgia, didn't do anything i mean they just did enough on offense to just hang around and that that last 10 minutes of the game they just looked like they were doing whatever they wanted to missouri's defense yeah i think they shot what like five of six from three in the second half or something like that they that what they made everything uh, for a stretch there and yeah i think you you summed it up pretty well i mean it just all happened so fast i'm really I, i only watched the the game once i'm trying to to figure out what happened it's like uh, my head was spinning after the game like whoa yeah. okay we had a 13 or 14 point lead in the second half of this game and lost by 10 what just happened and this is not the first time missouri has done one of these collapses where it's you're, you're just five minutes later you're wondering what what just happened and i'm i'm really uh, it's these you know four or five in-game collapses that we've had have i mean kept us from having a good uh, a great season we've we've uh, we've had a really good season but if we just stay consistent in some of these moments i mean we could be looking at a fantastic season and if we just pull out some of these wins versus mississippi state and georgia uh it felt like the effort was there in this game for the most part i just i don't know um i kind of gets paid three million dollars to figure out these kind of things because they're complicated why why why, why is this happening consistently where uh, Missouri can seems like they get so high, but also can just get so low, and they're just completely incapable of doing anything for minutes at a time. Yeah, on offense, when Missouri just goes completely cold for stretches, it's unlike anything I've seen, really, from a basketball team, where they'll just literally be unable to score points. And you've seen teams that are just, like, anemically bad offensively, and that's just, you know, they're just bad. But when Missouri can go hot and cold like this and just not be able to score a point i mean i was looking at the uh the win uh percentage graph on ken palm for this game and georgia went on three separate runs in the second half so missouri actually went on a 14-0 run to get out to a 13 point lead early in the second half then after that georgia went on a 30 uh, sorry 13 to 2 run few possessions later 12 to 2 run a few possessions later 16 to 2 run to close out the game so if you add those together just in that georgia game in just the second half and really past the 15 minute mark in the second half 
Georgia went on a combined run of 41 to 6 if you combine those three uh, separate runs into one thing. I'm I'm honestly kind of speechless like because I watched this game and I knew it was bad but that is something like I've never even heard of in my life like how does that happen and it's almost like you can feel it like the players yeah. kind of feel it coming on and you almost it's like oh my god here we go again like and it's almost like because it's happened they just like freak out or something and they don't know what to do they don't know how to stop the bleeding uh i i don't know i, I didn't watch closely enough to really notice the timeouts but i feel like in games recently i felt like this seems like a good time to call a timeout and Conzo, for whatever reason just lets him play through it I don't know if that would help at all to maybe try and call a timeout, get him, to, get him to calm down. I don't know. Yeah, it seems like sometimes he maybe calls it like two or three possessions late. Yeah. And as a fan, I feel like we're accustomed to seeing a team go on a run, take a lead. You know, especially um, if you're the away team and you're in this team's home court and they've gone on a run, and then the away team calls timeout. And the fans are hyped up. The players are kind of celebrating, going over to their huddle and their bench. And I don't know, maybe there's some, uh, this is obviously a speculation on my part, but maybe there's some psychological thing for Konza where he doesn't want to like signal that, yeah, Georgia, you've done something good here. You've gone on this run. You've, you know, you've done what you need to do. And now I'm going to call timeout because of what you've done. Surely, I, I would like to think that that's not the case because, and I don't know what all goes into the decision to call a timeout in a certain spot, but, and you wouldn't think with a veteran team, and this is maybe where Conzo's mind is, you wouldn't think with a veteran team like Missouri that you need to call timeout to settle them back down. You know, you'd think from play to play, they're composed enough to kind of get it under control, but obviously it seems like that's not the case and you need to maybe settle them down make a substitution to kind of kickstart the offense again yeah i think that's something that missouri gets labeled a lot is like they're an old experienced team and i think that is true but i'm not sure they've earned the right to be treated that way because they've shown time and time again that they a lot of our players like still have confidence issues they Mm -hmm. still get really flustered they are really inconsistent we turn the ball over a lot and we don't really have a lot of characteristics about our team that that match a team that's been playing together a long time and that are uh, experienced so if that's his reasoning I, i'm not sure that that holds up because they don't show those good signs of experienced teams in other ways so i i really think that i, I totally understand your logic and that makes a lot of sense that maybe he's just trying to avoid giving the other team kind of that celebration moment like hey we caused him to to call a timeout and mm-hmm. that makes sense but i think i would i, w- I think i'd like to see t- uh coach call a timeout when it w- maybe even try calling it too early yeah when, when you start to feel like you know we've gotten a lead and they are starting to push back a little bit just call timeout just right. let's let's not let this turn into a 12 to 2 run if it's a eight to two run let's let's call it now let's let's figure something out we got to change something up let's cool them off a little bit speaking of those runs i was just it seemed like that it seemed like as a fan watching i've seen these cold spells over and over again so i just went back and got a few of the more noteworthy runs that missouri has had against them lately uh against ole miss they ole miss had a 14 to 2 and a 17 to 2 run both in that game and then uh, obviously Alabama had a 21 to 2 run to get back into that game late Um, so I wasn't crazy that Missouri obviously basketball is a game of runs but you know 17 to 2 21 to 2 yeah those are just back-breaking game-changing runs and when and you're talking about two completely different scenarios there with Ole Miss that 17 to 2 run was just like them running away with the game Alabama 21 to 2 run that was them getting back in a game that Missouri should have just coasted to the finish line yeah the to the finish line yeah um that's an ironic uh slogan (laughs) (laughs) it's literally just about to say yeah maybe they should drop that little (laughs) mantra this year anyways um 
man, the Ole Miss game uh, was unique in the way that it felt like Missouri really just kind of died and just just let them just said, okay, I think we're we're done for tonight, and you guys you guys can ha- can can take this one. But our, in Arkansas, I think they played hard, just didn't have enough in the tank. And Georgia, I, I don't really know, man. I uh, they played really well for like most of the game. There was just like this small portion of the second half that they just got absolutely destroyed and I think a lot of that was Georgia just making every single shot and I don't I don't know what you do about that it seems like that's kind of happened to us a lot in this in the second half of the year as well is where teams just get hot and there's nothing we can do about it but maybe I should go back I should probably should analyze a little bit closer where timeouts are getting called and maybe that would give me a little bit a better idea of how they could use timeouts differently in the future but you get a lot of timeouts in the game. Like it feels like you, you got enough to just call one and and get your crap together. And yeah. it's not like there you only get one a half or something. Yeah. Maybe drop a play when your when your offense is cold. Drop a play to get a good look. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I got to think that having Tillman in there would make a difference, obviously. But Georgia is the type of team that I think Missouri should beat without Tillman, and they were well on their way before they just kind of melted down there in the second half um georgia did shoot quite well from three uh on limited attempts seven for 15 um and missouri was kind of back to their uh poor shooting ways six for 26 that's obviously way too many attempts um but they were coming off an arkansas game where they shot 32 threes and made 13 of them so um which of those is the outlier i think by this time in the season, Missouri as a team should know that they're not going to repeat that performance uh, in back-to-back games, most likely. If Torrance isn't going to play very much. Right. And uh, they shot 57% from two. So, you know, Kobe Brown, 21 points, 8 of 11 shooting from two, 0 for 4 from three. Yeah. So. That's true. I, I, yeah, I do want to point out, C- Kobe has played really well recently. He's, d- he's developed really nicely. And uh, sometimes, there, I don't know what it is about uh, – like when are you when you're on a team and and your your best player is is going to be out and sometimes the next guy is just like okay this is this is my opportunity to shine if I don't nobody else will and I've got to step up and it, it kind of seemed like Kobe did that in the last two games and um it's it's really great to see him uh scoring cuz he always plays hard but maybe doesn't get rewarded on the stat sheet but he he really did in this Georgia game so that was good to see but that was about the only bright spot of this game yeah, uh, Drew Smith, one for five from three. Uh, Xavier Pinson, one for seven from three yeah. against Georgia. It's not very good. It's a midweek away game. Yeah. Uh, seven, 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central. So yeah, I thought we no were fine. Excuse. Yeah. Um, one thing I do want to mention, unless you have anything else about this Georgia game, uh, some other teams have helped out Missouri recently. Uh, Oregon beat Colorado. Uh, which huge win for them, and that boosted them up a bit in the net rankings. And then Wichita State had a huge win against Houston. Yeah. And so that is really helping out Missouri when Missouri's not helping them themselves. Yeah. And it's going to help their uh, their quadrant situations. for Which resume. clearly has been valued by the selection committee. And Wichita State is quietly putting together a really solid season. I think they're in sole possession of first place in the AAC right now since they beat Houston. I believe they have the tiebreaker and are in sole possession oh i guess sole possession with a tiebreaker i suppose yeah. but uh and they've got the they've got an interim coach in a situation where they didn't think they were going to be very good he's uh, i can't remember his name at the top of my head but he's done a really nice job there for wichita state but i'm really glad missouri was able to to win a couple of those games um in the first half of their season because it's really going to help them out um later on and oregon's been dealing with some injury issues so they're finally all healthy again and uh, i think they're going to have a nice little end to their yeah. uh, Pac-12 season. Yeah, hopefully uh, those those teams are able to hang out. I think Missouri currently has six quad one wins, which is which is really solid. I think tied for third most in the country. Um, speaking of quad one wins and all that kind of stuff, I was looking at Gonzaga. Obviously, Gonzaga and Baylor are the two best teams in the country this year, mm-hmm. and it's not all that close. Uh, looking at Kim Palm, Gonzaga this season – has an adjusted efficiency margin of 38.33. That's the best of any team since Kim Pom, as far back as Kim Pom goes. 
Wow. Uh, there is an O2 Duke team that was 34 adjusted efficiency. Hmm. Um, there was uh, 08 Kansas team, 35 adjusted efficiency. Uh, for comparison, the best team Missouri's had in this stretch, uh, like the 09 team was a 24. The 2012 team was a 25. Uh, let's see, Kentucky, the year that they nearly went undefeated in 2015, they were a 36.9, so a 37, basically. And Gonzaga is a 38.33. So what's Baylor? Aren't they like a 35? Yeah, Baylor's a 35, yeah. So what you're telling me is we have two of the best teams ever in the Kempom era yeah. in the same season? Yeah. I believe that, man. I, I really haven't watched either of them play a whole lot, but – They've both just been so dominant in their respective seasons. And, I mean, Baylor's and the Big 12 is tough. Yeah. And, man, it is so hard to just win night in and night out in a, in a Power 5 conference. Yeah. Uh, Gonzaga's second on offense, sixth on defense. Baylor, fourth on offense, fifth on defense. And, and you talk about, like, the holy grail of college basketball for Ken Palm rating <laughs> is to be top 20 in both of those. Yeah. And they're top six in both of those. Baylor, top five in both of those. And, I mean, Gonzaga doesn't even – they don't even have a scare or anything no. like they they beat all they beat some really good teams in the non-conference yeah. and then in their conference season i mean th every game's a blowout there's not even any games that come close yeah yeah they beat number three iowa number 10 virginia they beat number 27 byu twice as their best uh conference foe yeah they're 99 percent to uh win out their, their last three games that seems pretty uh pretty good chance will they uh finally kind of shake off their demons and win the big one they just might man i'm ready to fill out some brackets <laughs> <laughs> i'm ready to fill out like 30 brackets <laughs> oh yeah 30 minimum uh all right let's look at missouri's upcoming schedule they go on the road to south carolina tomorrow uh south carolina we already beat this season uh, they are five and ten uh, three and eight in conference play number 88 in Ken Palm. 101 on offense, 84 on defense. In SEC play, they're 10th in offensive efficiency, 10th in defensive efficiency. And they've had a tough go of it this year. We've already talked previously about their um, shortened schedule because of COVID and the big gaps that they've had off. Um, they, this week, uh, lost to Tennessee by 20 points. Um, they've lost... Uh, four in a row in conference play, Mississippi State, Alabama, Ole Miss, and Tennessee. Missouri, just a two-point uh, favorite on the road at South Carolina. Surely Missouri wins this one. I think they do. <laughs> I mean, okay, talk about a back-to-your-wall situation. This is it. Tillman's back. He's uh, obviously he's been through so he's been through some tragedy in his life. And uh, I think I read that he knew about this death in his family during the Ole Miss game. Like he had found out prior to that game. And mm. so obviously that was not a good game for him. That was not a good game for the team. I think the team felt for him. Uh, and so he, he took some time away and hopefully he's OK. And uh, I hope that, you know, he's also maybe it's just it's a long season and maybe this was a chance to get get some time to spend with family away from the game a little bit and maybe he's i don't know if refreshed is the right word after yeah. being after a death in the family but um hopefully he he's uh he's okay and he's able to focus on on what's in front of missouri as a basketball team now and um i i think that i think hopefully this is going to be kind of a rebound game for missouri it kind of has to be and south carolina is not real great it's on the road but they're shorthanded. Their season just doesn't mean much anymore and it never really probably has at any point to them just with everything they're dealing with. This just has to be a win. Yeah, and uh, Missouri, I think, is going to have a tremendous advantage in the paint. Um, that's a huge struggle for Arkansas – or, sorry, not Arkansas, South Carolina defensively. Um, they're 224th in two-point shooting percentage defense. Um I think that's going to be Missouri's ticket. They have to 
dialed down the three point attempts and they have a perfect reason to focus on not shooting so many threes, getting Tillman back in the lineup. Um, I just, I don't want to see more than 19 three point attempts. If they hit 20, yeah. I'll be kind of not happy. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you. I think they, uh, I think they should say, Hey, Tillman, welcome back. Here's the ball on 60% of our possessions. <laughs> yeah. And even, even not, even necessarily Tillman. I mean, get the ball to Kobe Brown, get yeah. it to Parker Brown. Yeah. Kobe um, showed he's capable. Yeah. When, when Kobe, sometimes he'll like kind of make this play for himself where he kind of like fakes a pass or fakes a dribble handoff and mm-hmm. then just gets to the basket. Yeah. He, he really looks so good doing that. He really like has a surprisingly good ability to drive to the basket. He and got that quick burst from yeah. like the elbow that, uh, d- defenders just don't see it coming. Yeah, and he, he really finishes well too. I mean, it's one thing to get to the basket mm-hmm. and kind of beat your defender, but he he finishes yeah. uh, a lot of the time. Yeah, that's what I want to see against Arkansas. Why, <laughs> why do I keep <laughs> saying it's Arkansas? Are you looking at the no nothing Arkansas on my on my page screen? Nothing. It's haunting you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's what I want to see against South Carolina. There you go. Get it in the paint. Yeah, kick it out if necessary. Um, Mark drive to the basket. Um, he, he's got a decent floater. Sometimes he's he got can. a decent mid range pull up. If he can, at least if he's driving to the basket, at least maybe he'll get fouled and he's making free throws at a higher percentage than he has three pointers. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I definitely, at this point in the season, I feel more comfortable with, uh, Watson, Pickett, Penson, Drew Smith, feel more comfortable with all of them taking a three ahead of mark i agree that's a shame but it's reality uh okay south carolina missouri winning this one yep uh i'm gonna put it at uh 78 72 missouri wins Hmm. it is a road game (laughs) missouri slumping pretty majorly but I, I think they've got the type of team that can take advantage of South Carolina's weaknesses. I think we do see South Carolina score more points than we're comfortable with because that's been a trend lately. Missouri's defense faltering and not living up to the expectations that you know everybody has for them. Um, Pretty much everybody we've played recently has had one of their best offensive outputs yeah, or like something better than average right. than for them. So, I say Missouri wins. I'm going to say Missouri wins 79 to 78. Ooh, too close for comfort. That will be close, but we'll take the win any way we can get it. Yeah. Uh, then Missouri has their second rematch of the week with this one against uh, Ole Miss. Um and that's a team that has been trying to work themselves onto the NCAA tournament bubble. Um, I'll give you their breakdown real quick. They're 12 and 8, uh, 7 and 6 in conference. They're ranked 49th in Kempom, so one spot ahead of Missouri, I think, as we speak. Yeah. Um, 99th on offense, 18th on defense. In just SEC play, they are 11th on offense, 4th on defense. Yeah, I think they've been on COVID pause uh, a little bit here this week, too. Yeah, they're supposed to play Mississippi State tomorrow. Uh, let me see if I can find something on that game. Never mind, my computer just died. Oh, look. Thank Thanks. you. Um, yeah, man. Uh, <laughs> it's it's tough to gauge Missouri against Ole Miss considering what happened last time. I mean, you really the, the transit of property just isn't really something that exists all that often really within college basketball. I mean, you w- Missouri Valley Conference is doing – this thing this year where they are trying to eliminate travel and they they played teams like on back-to-back days and well i we've i've seen the craziest like swing of events like in back-to-back games like you can play the same team in the same season and totally different outputs can happen so i, I really think that missouri's got to get R- uh, Romello white in foul trouble again i think that w- yeah. they did that the first time and it didn't really end up mattering but if they can limit him again i think that'll be the key yeah, so Ole Miss coming off of uh, obviously, um, yeah, they haven't. They've only played one game since uh, they last played Missouri, uh, and that was a win over South Carolina. They won that by thirteen. 
Oh, sorry. They won that by eight. So um, I think I think Ole Miss is doing what they need to do to be in this NCAA tournament conversation. Um, they had nothing to show for any kind of non-conference schedule, so that's hurting them for sure. But they have an opportunity here with Mississippi State, Missouri, Vanderbilt, and Kentucky. Uh, we'll see how their the reschedules go for things because they do have a, a game that needs to be rescheduled. But um, plenty of winnable games down the stretch. This is the, the game against Missouri is the only one they're not favored in. So Missouri is favored by three, according to Ken Palm. And we know what Ole Miss is going to do. They're going to play really good defense. And despite what they did in that first matchup against Missouri, they are still one of the worst three-point shooting teams in the country. Actually worse than Missouri, believe it or not. And so I think, you know, playing them twice, they have to come back down to earth shooting compared to that first matchup. And it seems really silly to predict that Missouri would win two games in one week, but I really think they've got an opportunity. It's going to be close, I think. I agree. I think There's no way they, that Ole Miss shoots like they did. No. Uh, it's weird because when I think of Ole Miss, like, based on how they played against Missouri, I'm like, good grief, this is like a absolute machine of a team because they play incredible defense and they make everything. Like, how are we going to beat this team? But – I think the performance we saw from Ole Miss that night uh, a few weeks ago is really not who they are usually. Um, yeah, Jarkel least, Joyner, who like just destroyed us, uh, shooting 22% from three in conference play. That's insane and really frustrating. But, yeah, I, I think Missouri takes care of business against Ole Miss, and even though we have been his, historically, at least in the last whatever, since we joined the SEC, if you want to call that historically, we've been historically terrible against Ole Miss. Um, so we got to exercise some demons here. Uh, get some revenge and guard the perimeter, get Romello white in foul trouble. I think we win. It's going to be close though. Probably. Got a score for me. 73-68. I just don't think Missouri wins both of these games. Which one's which one's more likely that they'll win? South Carolina, I think. Pretty easily. I think they just match up a lot better with South Carolina. Yeah. I think Ole Miss has shown they're able to kind of give Missouri fits. To kind of take uh, away that strength Yeah, inside. And just kind of – they just play lockdown defense on the perimeter and just make it tough for Missouri to do things. It just – everything looks like a struggle yeah. against Ole Miss's defense. Yeah. And not – in a similar way that it does when you're playing against um, Tennessee. It just They kind of make everything look difficult. Mm-hmm. And so I think they'll do that again. I think probably Missouri drops this one. I think they lose uh, like 75 to 71, something like that. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, let's, let's talk bracketology. Let's I talk mean, bracketology. Um, <laughs> Missouri was a four seed in that uh, bracket preview. And they lost two games, one of them to Georgia. Although Georgia still, I mean, they've got six wins in the SEC now. So uh, top 100 team, hopefully still at the end of the season. How far do you have Missouri dropping from four now? Like if the season ended today? Yeah. Oh, man, it's so easy just to get caught up in like the here and now. Um, but if I'm still really looking at Missouri's resume – as a whole, without recency bias, I'll, I'll say they're a six seed. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree that that's where I think the committee would put them. Um, and it's still probably like the last six seed. So um, maybe borderline seven. But, you know, the committee is people, like yeah. we've mentioned before. And they're going to know that Jeremiah Tillman was out for the Arkansas and Georgia games. I hope so. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a small detail. Maybe when you're looking at the entire national landscape and – putting every single team in a, in a place mm-hmm. that I don't know. I don't know what, what level of detail they're looking at. And that absolutely could be something that's like top of mind. Like, Oh yeah, they played without Jeremiah Tillman, their best player. Right. And they're going to, Missouri is going to have to show that that does mean something by going out and winning games down the stretch True. to say, yeah, no, this is the team we are when we're, when we've got everybody. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd, pe- I'd put them at a six seed right now. 
with the way they're playing and their schedule down the stretch, I mean, I think they probably drop a little bit further than that just because I, th- I think they're going to finish it basically right at 500 in conference play. Yeah. And I think that would put them at around a eight seed. Man, it would be really disappointing if uh, if we don't finish the season very strong and kind of limp to the finish line and get an eight or nine seed. Man, that would be disappointing considering yeah. where we've been, like a top 10 team just uh, merely a couple of weeks ago. But I absolutely think that's that's uh, something that could happen and might be more likely to happen now. I think there's a better chance they're an eight or a nine than like a four yeah. seed now. Right. So uh, I did write write down a few numbers. I just obviously there's Missouri's second half woes have been something that have really jumped to the forefront in the last few games because it's been terrible. So I I wrote down Missouri how many points they've scored in every half of conference season. Uh, kind of divided by the first half and the second half and then their opponents first and second halves Mm -hmm. and uh, really Missouri is playing pretty consistently as far as just their points scored their their first halves have averaged about 36 points per game or per per half Mm -hmm. and then in the second half they're averaging about 34 points per half so it's really pretty similar the discrepancy is their opponents are averaging 32 points in the first half and 30 almost 40 points in the second half of game. So that's a pretty big discrepancy where for whatever reason, teams are taking advantage of Missouri in in the second half of the conference season. So you got to wonder if Missouri, it'd be interesting to see the scoring for the opponent in the second half, like on a timeline Mm -hmm. of the second half. Mm -hmm. Are they, are they starting the second half like with a flurry or are they just like, wearing Missouri's defense down over the course of the second half. Mm. That'd be interesting to see. But, um, yeah, it's definitely not all in our heads that Missouri's second halves have been uh, less than stellar this season. I didn't include TCU in these, but... um, Yeah, that's just conference play. Yeah, just in uh, second halves, if you just, like, if that were the full game, what's the second half, they'd be three and eight and then one tie. Uh, and then they're nine and three in first halves. So they they play they've been playing better in the first half of games than second halves clearly. And uh, it's Conzo Martin's job to figure out what's going on. Yeah, that's that's puzzling. It really is. That is very strange. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah. And I was gonna have you guess uh, what Missouri's lowest scoring individual half was and their highest scoring individual half. And uh, the listeners can obviously play along, but... Can I look at their schedule? Yeah. To try to... uh, Lowest scoring half would be the second half against Mississippi State. Right? Uh, Very... Okay, I actually decided to... uh, divide this up by first and second half so i should have asked you what was their lowest scoring first half oh i gotcha that was my fault uh lowest scoring first half give me uh the first half against tennessee correct scored 25 points (laughs) that's not very good (laughs) and uh their second half of games i think i like that my guess is uh, mississippi state on that one close it was the second half versus ole miss which oh, yeah. they only scored 22 points, but the Jeez. Mississippi State was, game was 24. Man. Their, uh, their highest scoring first half came against South Carolina. Uh-huh. They scored 45. Their highest scoring second half came against the first time they played Arkansas. They scored 48. Wow. Man. Missouri has struggled to uh, put together two halves in the same game yeah. this year. Also, one more thing I wanted to point out. The second half versus Mississippi State, uh, Mississippi State scored 51 points. So that second half was a 51 to 24 point discrepancy. That's that's ugly. Oh. How does that happen? That's a that's a half. That's an entire half long run. That's an entire that half run. long run of mid range jumpers. <laughs> yeah, it was. That they wasn't n- it? never missed. <laughs> My goodness. All right. Well, well, that is a little, that's, that's kind of depressing, but I guess I did. I wanted to try and end this podcast on a, on a good note because I know this whole thing has been 
been kind of depressing, but it's really, like I said a few minutes ago, it's really easy just to kind of get lost in the here and now. And I know it's, it's been a really rough last like seven to 10 days for Mizzou fans, but I don't know. It's been a really good season so far and it's probably been better than anybody really thought it was going to be. And I think we should all just take a deep breath and like really just like appreciate the season we've had. And I think we're going to, I think we're going to bounce back. We're going to make the tournament. We'll hopefully be a six or seven seed in the tournament, which is still far beyond what Missouri has achieved and really on average in the last 10, 15 years. So, um, it's going to be okay. Yep. I think Missouri is going to get back to their winning ways. We've got a, got a few more games with, with, uh, with a really good team and some really like beloved players. Yeah. Um, Missouri does have a couple opportunities to pick up solid wins. I mean, they play Florida, they play um, LSU still if the reschedules uh, happen accordingly. So um, still need to beat the teams you're supposed to beat. And there's going to be more coin flip type games looking forward than we would have thought, you know, a week or two ago. Yeah. Uh, but we got to win some of those and then knock off one of these teams that are higher in, in the standings in the sec right now and yeah right back where we thought we could be yeah i mean I've, I've seen a lot of i've seen a lot of negativity on twitter and that's that's how the internet is sometimes and, and people are are short-sighted a lot of times but man like don't just don't go there if you can if you can help it don't go there we just played the last couple of games without our best player and Conzo's not going anywhere for at least another couple seasons so just do yourself a favor. Don't go to that dark place in your mind where you're thinking about a new coach. I'm, I'm a week away from it, Kyle. Like it's, I know it's, it's really easy to, to do it, but just try it and block those thoughts out of your brain and just stay positive. One more, one more bad week. I'm, I'm right there in the depths of it. I think I'm afraid. So we need a win. Nice knowing you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Is that all we have for the folks? That's all I got for the folks. All right. All right, everybody, you can find this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or on Twitter and Instagram at Mizzou Sports Pod, and you can email us at MissouriSportsPod at gmail.com. You can find our T-shirts and stickers on our online shop, MissouriSportsPod.BigCartel.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We will see you next week. Bye, everyone.